Hi everyone, I would like to welcome all of you for attending our Talent Trends webinar for the retail sector. My name is Howard Chan and I am the Regional Director of Michael Page. I'm excited to share with you our agenda for today. First, we will cover the landscape of the retail sector, followed by an update on the luxury retail market. Then we will move on to discuss the key findings from a Talent Trends report. And finally, we will wrap up with a Q&A session. I'm excited to share with you today our speakers who uh, come from various profiles and backgrounds. So first, I would like to start off with Cindy Wong, who is, our head, who is the head of tourism of Invest Hong Kong. Cindy has been with the group for over 16 years and is responsible for bringing new retail, F&B and hospitality companies to Hong Kong. Welcome, Cindy, and thank you for participating today. Thank you, Howard. Good morning. Thank you, Cindy. Next, I would like to introduce to all of you, Sonia Lee, who is a seasoned retail expert and has held various senior positions for many leading luxury fashion brands, such as Louis Vuitton, Prada, Dior, Mont Blanc, and Patek Philippe, just to name a few. Sonia, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Howard. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sonia. Finally, I would like to introduce to you my colleague, Barry Kwok, who is the director of Michael Page, responsible for running the retail and F&B practice. And he has been with the group for 12 years. Thank you, Barry, for your time as well. Thank you, Howard. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning, everyone. This is Cindy from Invest Hong Kong. I'm the head of tourism and hospitality. I mainly cover food and travel, uh, which are very interesting sectors. And today, it is our great pleasure for me to share uh, with you the retail landscape and opportunities in Hong Kong. Special thanks to Howard of Michael Page for inviting me too. In case you Pleasure. may wonder who is Invest Hong Kong? Invest Hong Kong, we are a government department. Our services are all free. We help companies like yours to expand into Asia through Hong Kong. We guide you through planning and evaluation of your company setup presentation of visa and license application, and introduction to service providers and industry contacts. Contact us anytime if you need our assistance. Okay, now let me start with a few observations globally that we share from Euromonitor. Actually, COVID-19 is a big wake-up call for all of us. We have a second chance to build back better. People and companies are all more concerned about sustainability. Consumers will take social and environmental issues more seriously, rewarding businesses that use their profits for good post-pandemic, use less plastic, and reduction of food waste are keys to rebuild a greener and more equitable world. More businesses will reposition from a pure profit strategy to join a purpose-driven movement, Build Back Better, BBB will improve businesses' resilience, brand re uh, reputation, and also financial value. The second one uh, I want to focus will be the outdoor oasis. Uh, nowadays, open air really gives trapped customers like us an escape. People look for outdoor venues for dining, exercising, socializing, and also relaxing. After COVID, Outdoor venues or indoor alternatives will continue to be encouraged. Open air activities remain beneficial, especially the therapeutic effects of the outdoors on mental well being. We all need it. Uh, businesses can replicate their indoor offerings outdoors by building temporary structures and improving infrastructure. Integrating outdoor oasis features will become essential for leisure and entertainment providers to attract new customers and retain loyalty. Adopting business models to suit adverse weather conditions and addressing health concerns will be major business tactics to cater to outdoor oasis consumers. Creating both indoor and outdoor offerings will ensure the business continuity. The next thing um, I will talk about is the safety obsessed. Uh, nowadays, of course, safety and hygiene comes first. It's the first thing that we consider when we go out or when we come back from outside. Safety and health will be the forefront of consumer behavior. Companies across industries should develop robust 
hygiene initiatives in response to heightened concerns. Businesses that incorporate exceptional sanitation features into products and services while communicating these benefits will attract safety-obsessed customers like me. Um, and attend e-commerce and e-commerce will be widely adopted where unnecessary human interactions are minimized. Consumer needs will evolve from basic hygiene to general health. As consumers turn to necessities, a safe and trusted brand image will be intangible asset for business. Lastly, the global trend I think is rele really relevant for Hong Kong and for us here. Uh, it's about the thoughtful drifters. Uh, we are all expecting some kinds of recession nowadays, and people tend to be more cautious in spending. Um, the economic uh, environment will continue to influence the consumer spending as consumers switch to generic brands amidst economic hardship. Spending private local offerings will benefit retailers. At the same time, companies should identify and market attributes consumers are willing to pay a premium for. We are just saying product portfolios, distribution channels, promotions, and supply chains to cater to thoughtful filters will future proof businesses for a new normal for us. There is no one size fits all approach, but brands should find innovative ways to regain value and enhance the price value equation. Convenience, increased online penetration, fast last mile delivery or add-on services are ways companies can achieve this. A focus, insight-driven, local tailored promotional plan will enhance return on investment. So uh, now we can look into uh, locally Hong Kong. We can see companies, they are already adopting the above strategies for retail business. I can see that you know shopping mall is reshipping uh, their tenancy portfolio to mass market and family segments already, as an in experiential rate retail and also new uh, leisure and entertainment concepts, like in the cases of uh, long queues outside each Don Don Donkey. Actually, they just opened um, a new one uh, at uh, Suicide One, uh, the island resort uh, yesterday. And also, we will have a new, uh, soon to be opening, Legoland Discovery Center at uh, 11, K11 this year. Uh, hope that you know they can open up the Chinese New Year when the government lifted uh, the restrictions. We are all waiting, you know, the government to lift the restriction. Even though I am the government, but I cannot tell when we can do that yet. Um, the next thing is about uh, the inter in terms of the sales channels. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, E-commerce is finally on the rise. Also, omni-channels and personalized experience for retailers and f &B, uh, operators. Nowadays, we can see pop-up stores and uh, weekend markets are sprouting all over Hong Kong and even online islands for branding and discounted products. Um, I think um, I will leave uh, Sonia to talk about more about the luxury segment later uh, uh, for the retail. Uh, let us move to my specialty. Actually, it's the F and B side. Um, there are huge changes in the new online consumer ecosystem. Now, already, uh, it's already evolving. Um, I can say that food delivery companies are already expanding into e-grocery, while others are also tapping into the meal delivery business. New normal of staying home more means there is continuous demand for takeaways and online shopping. And that's why your products need to be handy, easy to deliver and stock, and must be in smaller portion as our home is so small. And the second thing is, um, we are eating healthier these days. I'm more concerned about the worldwide food sustainability issues. We are starting to include more plant-based ingredients into our meals. We Chinese, we love to eat pork. Uh, Omnipop, made from mushroom and soy, which even developed recipes tailor made for the Asian palates. For example, you can find these, you know, in the supermarkets, like pop dumplings, steamed buns, fried noodles, uh, luncheon meat, and even minced pork for cooking. They are actually delicious. I tried most of them. And getting more popular, when sometimes the supply chain of pork is affected, and people are skeptical about swine flu and other diseases. 
Um, other brands like Beyond Meat, Just Eggs, and Impossible Foods are also having a uh, good response from Asian consumers. So we welcome more alternative protein products nowadays uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, because of COVID, we tend to stock up more frozen, ready to eat meals at home. Uh, because, you know, uh, who knows if your building was suddenly being called for lockdown, you know, in two hours nowadays. Uh, we do not want to compromise on taste and nutrition. And there are some recipes are even cooked by celebrity chefs. Uh -huh, or central kitchen. The next one is about the food services. Um, they are now refocusing a lot on the takeaway business. They are modifying the menu for takeaway and the delivery. Um, they set up also central or cloud kitchens to minimize cost and investment already. You can see that you know these are easier menus like pizza or rice balls. For the next slide is about, uh, you can see there are still uh, companies opening or expanding their business in Hong Kong and nowadays small is the new big. Smaller size shops actually is better to serve the locals and great for entrepreneurs and also chef owners to test a new concept and even replicate for a franchise model later. So I think you can stay tuned, more to come. The last one uh, update or you're sharing for me is about the gourmet food hall concept. You may have been to the base hall of dining house already. So we can see that more food hall con concept will be expanding all over Hong Kong. They are mainly to serve the neighborhood district and the locals. The other one, uh, the food lot uh, is uh, Park Aura is uh, in Ting Hao. Also very interesting food hall concept you can look into as well. So I hope I have provided some useful observations uh, with this short presentation. There are plenty of opportunities still in Hong Kong. Let us work on it together. If you wish to know more, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. I wish you all good health and all the best in the year of the ox and happy Friday. Thank you. Over to you, Howard. Thank you, Cindy. I really appreciate the sharing. <laughs> what really resonated me what, with me is is the build back better concept, and and I can certainly see, particularly for Hong Kong, you know, the the importance and emergence of a greener, healthier lifestyle. So what you mentioned about the plant based products, um, and even think when you say s small small is the new big, uh, you know, we're certainly seeing a lot more trend in that. I've personally visited the the food courts that you talked about, and certainly we, I think we're all accustomed to doing e-commerce and online deliveries and shopping. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, next, I want to move on to talking about and discussing the, the luxury market sector. And we have Sonia uh, here to, to share her insights. So we have a few questions that uh, we would like to ask Sonia. Um, and so uh, let's let's get uh, started with the question. So, so the first question I have uh, for you, Sonia, is what are your general thoughts and observations on the luxury retail sector? Okay, um, in terms of the luxury retail sector, we need to look at it uh, from two angles. One, okay. it would be before the COVID, and yeah. one, once uh, the other side would be after COVID. Uh, before COVID, I would say that uh, most of the brands are uh, riding on their brand power. So meaning um, their model is very brand centric, very controlled and confidential. To, to the outsiders. Whereas um, after the COVID, I believe that nothing will be the same anymore. It will be a new challenging world for the luxury industry. And uh, therefore the brands need to become more uh, transparent towards the customers um, using more engaging um, strategies. And um, overall customer centric would be the key word. Um, when you compare the both um, perspectives, pre-COVID, it's more exclusive. It's exclusive to the very few. And um, post-COVID uh, would be more about inclusivity, about community, about uh, giving a purpose to luxury and um, involving people from all different walks of life and uh, make luxury um, interesting in terms of uh, you don't just buy a product, but you buy uh, meaning. 
Got it. So more on the purpose, more on the employment branding. Um, and at the same time, I think the strategy is to cater to a, a much more broader audience uh, of a larger demographic, as opposed to the more traditional sense of luxury, where it was where it appealed to, let's say, a small, smaller, more exclusive audience of a certain demographic. Correct. Correct. Okay. Excellent. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I have a second question for you, Sonia. The second question is moving, diving a little bit deeper into the product categories. What are your thoughts on specific product categories, such as, let's say, watch and jewelry, leather goods, shoes, and other categories? Any insights on the categories? Okay. Um, I personally believe that the coming trend would be about um, aspiring to fewer but better luxury goods. So meaning um, the customers will become more uh, selective than before. It will be yeah. less about impulsive buying. It will be less about um, trend following. Uh, instead, it will be about essentialism uh, and elevated essentialism. What I mean by that is um, it's about um, so-called investment pieces. Mm -hmm. um, customers will be buying probably more expensive, but um, for longer usage and uh, with a higher resale value. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this is because um, the consumer mind will change gradually um, after this um, COVID experience. People will live more consciously and uh, work-life balance and family and uh, quality will become uh, more important. Therefore, the brands need to make a um, significant uh, contribution to the VIP lifestyle uh, while driving positive change in the world. Right. Okay, understood. Um, I mean, I think we see a lot more, particularly in the watch and jewelry side, the, the, the emergence of these very exclusive, very limited edition products. and. Um, I, I, I guess this is probably the trend moving forward, right? I, I see a lot more limited products, limited edition products in the market yes. compared to before. Yeah. In terms of um, product categories, I would say that uh, watch and jewelry will remain strong. Okay. And in particularly um, high jewelry, I would say, because uh, mm. those are considered investment pieces. Anything right. that is above a million, for instance, um, these are pieces which can be auctioned later as well. So, or, or keep it for the next generation. And in mm. terms of watches as well, uh, people will go for uh, limited editions. Like uh, you have some brands uh, which are very, very strong and uh, some I've worked for before. <laughs> yeah. I believe they will remain strong. So, but do you think the market is changing because they want to move into more of that collector's sort of category? So more, you know, they buy it to resell as opposed to really using the product i think um Are this changing direction or behavior yes uh, i think you know 10 years ago it was more about uh following the trend and uh big recognizable um, pieces yeah and um, the mass was uh, targeted whereas now i'm um, slowly in the watch industry um the consumers are being educated it's about upgrading the customer in terms of, um, you know, becoming a collector. You can collect small, you can collect big, you can collect a uh, limited edition. So there's no limit to becoming a collector of all kinds. Right. And um, in terms of um, leather goods and shoes, accessories, I think those categories which um, mainly appeals to the mass and uh, this will, will, will be stagnant for a certain period of time after the economy will uh, revive again. Uh, but limited edition uh, handbags, for instance, or, or handbags of uh, a certain brand, as you know, uh, those will always remain um, uh, high in terms of resellable value and uh, they will be uh, sought after. Right. Uh, no matter I noticed there are a lot more collaborations as well for these leather yes. goods and shoes brands, um, yes. which I see is a growing trend as well. So, um, the reason for having collaborations uh, with uh, some brands it's to target the millennials, the mm -hmm. Gen Z, 
generation because uh, they make up of the biggest proportion of the luxury right. line. Right. And um, also, what they are looking for is not just a um, brand logo. They do not follow uh, blindly. Instead, um, there must be some interesting, uh, you know, like uh, uh, they're, they're looking for changes. They're looking for uh, newness in terms of ideas, not just in products. Mm -hmm. Yes. Understood. Okay. Well, thank you very much for sharing this. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, I'm also interested to know, do people buy less uh, luxury products during COVID-19 or do you think it's about the same? Given the fact that you mentioned, you know, the strategy has changed to a broader audience, broader demographics. Um, they're changing their approaches to appeal to different audiences. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Okay. Um, I think, I think um, most people could have guessed it <laughs> to answer this question, uh, even myself. I think uh, prioritizing money for value and reducing um, spending on uh, non-essential goods, it's uh, a strategy for most of the families nowadays. <laughs> and um, it's also because of the social distancing, uh, we, we are not allowed to travel at the moment. So of course there are less, uh, fewer tourists. Uh, just imagine, you know, like, uh, I think it was um, 2018, uh, Cindy, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there were like 65.1 million PRC tourists. And uh, just imagine without this chunk of business, uh, it's it's a lot, it's huge. And the locals, for instance, uh, they are staying home. And uh, there are also fewer uh, uh, gathering occasions, parties, events. So people are not really in a buying mood because even after buying, they won't be able to use uh, the luxury products as often as they used to. So of course, uh, uh, the luxury spending um, has declined a lot. And I think it's, uh, it's one of the most difficult years uh, in the, within the last 20 years I've seen so far. Yeah, I think, I think, um... I think you're you're right in terms of the market and the sentiment and how we respond. But in terms of the outlook, do you think this will improve this year? Um, I would say depending on how you compare it, you know, yeah. and compared to which year in uh, the, um, to call it an improvement. So uh, certainly, I believe uh, once. Um, the vaccines are in place, people mm -hmm. um, start to feel safe again. Yeah. And, uh, if they go out, there will be a, a, a rush in um, spending because they have been refrained um, from spending for such a long time. Right. And, uh, but because um, the Hong Kong market is rather interesting, uh, it's not a big place, as you know, and uh, there have been uh, the the uh, retail network in terms of um, very big um, flagship stores, the footprint uh, is really big, which has mm -hmm. been made and uh, to cater um, the tourism business. I would say the the main mainly the main and Chinese tourism, and um, whether the seven point something million uh, local uh, customers can absorb all those. Um, uh, 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 I mean, I mean, such a big store network is a question. So I believe the trend will be um, most of the brands will close down a few of their um, boutiques, right. and some of them, in order to go cut costs, will move their regional offices to either Singapore or China, for instance, uh, where labor cost and rents uh, will be lower, and also because uh, China will be the focus market for most of the brands yeah. and uh, therefore the, it will also make sense to have the HQ close by. But here in Hong Kong, I think um, what brands need to do is really to uh, rebuild the relationship with their high net worth client um, who have been, I would say, who have been neglected for, for a few years because we are so used to catering to the PRC um, tourist business. 
and um, the skill set in order to um, uh, build those relationships um, mm. is something that also uh, needs to be trained. Yeah. Yeah. So um, obviously with, with um, border control, you know, the focus is definitely on the domestic market. And what you're saying is that the shift should be more focused on the domestic, as you mentioned, the high net worth market um, yes. has obviously a strategy. Once border control opens, um, then certainly we would expect a higher influx of, of traffic in, in the, uh, on the ground. Uh, so hopefully this would, uh, you know, boost the, the, the luxury market overall? Uh, I would say that um, the mindset has to change, the mindset, okay. uh, meaning that uh, the brand should focus on the uh, locals and any kind of um, tourism business should be considered as a bonus. I think that way would be a safer, uh, safer approach. Yeah, makes sense. And as you mentioned, there might be possible, you know, organizations and companies maybe moving their offices from Hong Kong to other regions. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually going on already uh, with a few. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you for sharing this. Um, I have one more question for you, Sonia, which is uh, what, what marketing strategies are companies employing to attract their customers, given, you know, the challenges with, that we talked about, you know, fewer traffic, um, you know, what do you see in that space? Um, Sydney has also mentioned uh, one part uh, which is happening in the luxury industry as well as in the mass market. It's about uh, experiential engagement. So people are looking more and more for um, newness, creativity. Um, with that, I'm referring to um, pop-up stores, for instance, mm. collaborations, uh, temp stores, uh, special events. And, uh, but the special events will be different to uh, what luxury brands used to do. It's not about making huge noise, uh, huge events. It's more about uh, small, meaningful events catering to specific um, clients, make it more personal. Mm -hmm. And um, before luxury used to stand as a status symbol for wealth. And um, since after this COVID experience, a lot of people will um, change their lifestyle, uh, look at life a little bit differently, um, meaning that there will be a shift in values. <clears throat> and that will also happen with the way they consume uh, luxury goods. It will become more about uh, susta sustainability. What I mean with that is um, people would be uh, interested to know where the goods are coming from. It's not only about uh, where the goods are made, but it's right. about the quality um, and also um, whether it's environmentally friendly. For instance, like fur. Fur used to be, sorry about the phone, fur used to be a big thing uh, in the past because it, it stands for power, it stands for wealth. But now it's, um, uh, I, I think uh, some luxury brands will take away the fur option. I see. Yes, mm -hmm. and um, eco-friendly uh, fabrics will become another trend. And uh, another very, very um, obvious uh, change is um, e-commerce. E-commerce has been um, a practice has been a practice in China for quite a while already. And uh, while in Hong Kong two years ago, the e-commerce was around 5% uh, of, uh, of the entire business. So, yeah. so now um, e-commerce will become not only as a, uh, will not only be used as a sales channel, but also as a source of inspiration, like, um, you know, sharing information. Um, uh, they, are, they are very interesting articles. Um, they write about different topics. Uh, for, for the luxury market and uh, all these um, strategies or, or, or change you could call it um, should be targeting the locals so whatever yeah. whatever the brands are, are going to do in the future um, 
they need to lo look into um, the, the value, the, the behavior, the needs uh, of the local Hong Kong uh, market. Because uh, this also starts with the uh, merchandise. For instance, the merchandise assortment. The buying of the merchandise assortment was uh, mainly um, catering to, to the taste of um, PRC tourism. Right. No matter whether they buy in Hong Kong or they buy in France or they buy in Italy or anywhere, because they make, made out the big portion, uh, proportion of the clientele. But now if the brands would like to target the locals, they need to go back to uh, what the locals need. For instance, Hong Kong luxury clients, uh, they go for minimalism, they go for uh, sustain, the sustainability, and um, also they, they are very sophisticated, they know what is value for money. So, um, so, so that's why I think uh, more more attention more thoughts need to be given to that area right okay thank you Stan. i really appreciate your sharing uh lots of food for thought and, and certainly a you know a shift and change in in the luxury market so um thank you very much for sharing some of your observations and insights um from what i can see you know the focus should be more on the domestic market until obviously the border control is open. Uh, and uh, look, we're keeping our fingers crossed to hope that obviously the luxury market will come back um, bigger and stronger uh, once I think the border control is open. So we have uh, Barry uh, who will share his findings with you. Before uh, we move on to, to Barry's section, uh, I also want to uh, invite you guys to ask any questions uh, and submit your questions on the Q&A side as we will move on to the Q&A section right after Barry's uh, section. So uh, please feel free to submit any questions you have on Q&A and we'll try and answer uh, as much as we can. So uh, Barry, over to you. Um, thank you, Howard. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Barry and I manage our retail and f &B business at MicroPage Hong Kong. Um, thank you to Cindy and Sonia for sharing your perspective with us on the market outlook. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more on the recruitment side of things and share some of our key findings, um, hiring factors and talent attraction from a report. Um, before I start, um, let me give you a little background on our report. Our 2021 talent trend report features insights and market sentiment in Asia Pacific. Uh, we have surveyed uh, 12 Asia Pacific markets with over 5,000 businesses and 20,000 employees of which over 3,500 uh, directors or C-level positions. Um, and 2020 is uh, really a tough year for everyone. Um, Hong Kong retail sales dropped by 24.3% 24 for the year due to COVID. Um, however, a lot of retailers um, have an expectation and hope that um, the retail market will bounce back this year. Um, we all know that um, ESS last year has supported a lot of um, retail and F&B businesses. So this year, um, a lot of retailers will, will take a more uh, conservative approach um, in hiring, but um, they are still remaining uh, optimistic. Um, so the key this year uh, will be flexibility. Um, Part-timers and contractors will become a significant part of the workforce uh, to cater to, to all the pop-up stores and all the uh, short-term leases. Um, digitalization will, will continue to be a big trend in 2021. Um, with uh, digitalization, businesses are run more efficiently with less costs and at the same time, um, enhancing uh, customer experience. Um, funny enough, uh, um, customers nowadays uh, would prefer to, to use an app instead of dealing with actual people. Um, therefore, retailers must uh, really innovate and, and make use of the latest digital commerce strategies uh, to cope with the developments uh, retail will be facing in the post-COVID environment. Um, uh, many companies have already started to convert the business process over to using the, uh, digital technologies, um, like online booking systems, um, automatically uh, cashiers and delivery apps are just a few examples. And we see with the food delivery trend, um, we're seeing um, a lot of F&B companies are setting up cloud kitchens or ghost kitchens where they do not actually have a physical restaurant, um, but a virtual restaurant. So they only focus on deli delivery businesses. Um, echoing to um, what Sonia said um, just now, um, the Hong Kong retail landscape has uh, really shifted from 
focusing all their attention to mainline customers to um, rebuilding their image to appeal to um, more locals. Um, the taste of the local customers in Hong Kong are very different. Um, they may be may not may not be the big spenders comparing to the mainlanders, and they may not always go for the uh, big luxury brands. Um, uh, Hong Kong customer focus more on value for money, uh, their shopping experience, and, and the brand image. Um, for example, um, questions like does the product fit the personal lifestyle? Um, what is the story behind the brand? Um, are the products eco friendly? Um, are they made from a sustainable source? Um, businesses have to really um, change their marketing strategies, focus more on sustainability and building a brand image that will appeal to, to the Hong Kong people. Um, now, um, let's take a look at um, some of the key findings from, from our Thailand report. Um, the retail companies that have participated in our survey, 20% uh, of them um, expect headcount to increase in 5%, by 5% in, in 2021. Um, according to what Cindy has mentioned earlier, uh, mass market will continue to dominate. And um, as a result, you see on the left, um, the in-demand roles will be the operations and store management positions, and also um, category buyers for supermarkets. Um, due to the social distancing restrictions, um, the new normal is to dine at home. Um, the cloud kitchen concept has created a huge demand in chef positions. Um, we also uh, received a lot of requests for private chefs as well. Um, as for the most applied positions, uh, you see on the box on the right, um, because of the travel restrictions, um, luxury retail companies have had many downsizing activities, um, positions related to frontline retail, um, like buyers, um, retail trainer, VMs, and frontline sales um, are the most applied positions at the moment. Okay, let's um, take a look at the salaries. Um, I think salary increment and bonus is a topic which I'm sure everyone is interested um, to hear about. Um, as vaccines are starting to distribute around the world, uh, we do anticipate the retail market to slowly pick up. Um, from our findings on the right, the average salary increase in 2021 is, is around 1.8% and bonus payout is around 10%, which um, is a little bit more than one month of bonus. Um, the average salary offer for new hires would be in the range of 6 to 10%, in which uh, we can foresee that it will move to a more upward trend as the market slowly recovers. So um, some of the key questions that uh, we ask our hiring managers is, um, what is the biggest consideration when employing a, a new talent? Um, obviously, skill sets and experience is very important. However, we can see the trends from recent years that uh, cultural fit um, is also an area which hiring managers do put a lot of emphasis into. Um, does the candidate align to the company values? Uh, do they love the brands and, and can they represent the brands, etc.? Um, I just talked about uh, what hiring managers want. Uh, let's see what the job seekers want. Um, from the pool of candidates um, that we surveyed, only 45% of um, employed retail professionals anticipate uh, looking for new opportunities in 2021, um, while another 39% are only passively open due to the uncertainty of the retail market. Um, besides money and lack of growth, um, what are the top three reasons that would cause retail professionals to leave their jobs is actually lack of transparency um, in leadership communication. Um, we can see from the candidates that stability and job security is what they value nowadays. And if they cannot see or hear from the top, um, they would feel very insecure. Therefore, transparency and leadership communication is, is extremely important to keep the staff stable in the current retail market. 87% um, of retail professionals state that um, salary and benefits is the top consideration for accepting a job offer. But uh, they're also increasingly looking at brand reputation, uh, corporate culture, and professional development opportunities um, when making the decisions. Um, we can see that many retail companies uh, are shifting the focus from purely um, using competitive salary and benefits to attract talents um, to building a more um, dynamic company culture, which um, we see is the top talent attraction strategy in 2021. Um, also due to um, social distancing, many companies are also implementing remote or flexible work arrangement um, to provide more flexibilities um, 
to the staff. And at the same time, they can also um, save rental costs as some of the companies have already started to downsize the office as they do not need to have so much um, office space as before. Um, so I guess, so this comes to an end to our uh, talent trap report findings. Um, these, are, these are just some of the high level findings that um, we've prepared today. Um, for more inquiries, please feel free to browse our talent trend report or reach out to me and Howard for, for more information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. Thank you for sharing, Barry. Um, with the time that we have, uh, I'm keen to move on to the Q&A session as I see that we have a few questions being asked already. Uh, so let's, let's move on to Q&A. Okay, so I have, I see a few questions. Uh, starting with the, the first question for, for all of you. Um, Chinese tourists have always been a key group of customers in the Hong Kong retail market pre-COVID. Uh, while there's a shift in the retail landscape to more mass market or even e-commerce platforms under the pandemic, how do you foresee the change in retail spending or the retail landscape when border controls flex? So I think Sonia briefly talked about this part, but I mean, perhaps, uh, the audience is really interested to hear, you know, what happens after uh, the border controls flex, after the vaccines come through. Uh, wh what are your what are your thoughts on this? And I suppose this applies to uh, not only the luxury market but also the mass market as well. So, so perhaps a question for um, Sonia, Cindy, and and Barry. If there's anything you want to add, you can share as well. Mm. Uh, like I mentioned before. Um, even if after the borders are open, um, I do not foresee that um, the the luxury spend spending um, yeah. uh, will surge back to what it used to be. Instead, um, you know, like uh, the high net worth um, PRC clients, um, because during these uh, this last year. They are becoming more and more used to spending locally within China. Before before COVID, um, the practice or, or habit was more about jet setting. So a lot of high net worth clients uh, from China used to jet set to overseas countries, particularly uh, Europe, mm -hmm. France, Italy, and so on. And uh, they like to come to Hong Kong to shop. It's one. Uh, it's because of convenience. It's close by, and also because it's tax free, and also right. because uh, we are we 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 can speak Mandarin over here, uh, and um, it's easier communication. But then, uh, after what has happened in the recent last two years, um, I, I believe that um, the PRC clients, first of all, they are more adaptive now to spending locally and the service in china is also very well adapted to their needs the ratio between the number of sales staff versus one client uh, it's something I, I think in hong kong we cannot uh, we cannot copy because uh, you, you know you may have like five to ten um, sales staff really serving one client and uh, whereas in hong kong after this um, COVID experience, uh, there has been some laid off in most of the companies. Right. So meaning uh, the staff ratio versus client will be lower. And um, so, so, so I believe that uh, once the border will open, of course, you have some PRC clients coming back, especially the ones who have uh, properties here, like a second home in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. or maybe businesses in Hong Kong. So they will still buy in Hong Kong out of convenience and uh, need. But those who are traveling around uh, or those who don't have homes in Hong Kong, I think um, they will only come to Hong Kong probably occasionally, not as often as uh, used to. Right. And also uh, for the Hong Kong clients, uh, no matter whether it's high net worth or, or uh, uh, you know, normal um, luxury consumer like ourselves, uh, I think um, the sales force in Hong Kong needs to be uh, retrained about how to communicate to locals, how to take care of the locals and uh, how different are the needs of the locals versus the PRC clients they used to serve. Mm -hmm. And uh, because uh, with 
over 10 years of uh, luxury um, sales focusing on PRC customers, uh, it was really about big sales, big ticket items, and uh, everything was quick, fast, and uh, the, uh, the number of products on one, in one transaction was always huge. Uh, whereas now it's not about uh, speed, uh, quantity, it's more about quality and long-term relationship with the client. So therefore, uh, all those younger uh, sales staff generation, I would say after, uh, born after 90s, <laughs> they, need, they, they will need to uh, exchange uh, ideas uh, with the ones, um, for instance, who are born in the 60s, 70s and 80s, who have been there to serve uh, pre um, PRC, um, you know, uh, b before the tourism boom happened, uh, it was a totally different way. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess um, there need to be a change in mindset, like I, I mentioned before, not only uh, for the consumer themselves, but also for for the brands and for the employees of the brands as well. Right. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Sonia. Um, Cindy, anything you want to add? Uh, not really. I think uh, Sonia answered, you know, most of, you know, these scenarios. Uh, how about, you know, since we have some questions, do you want to move on to the second one? Yeah, the second question is more targeted for you, Cindy. Uh, what are your recommendations to local small retailers uh, for F&B uh, mm -hmm. in order to stay resilient and maintain business sustainability under the current economic situation? Well, I think um, the answer will be, you know, um, nowadays it's all about collaboration. Like we are working with you, Michael Page, you know, the Invest Hong Kong government is working with different organizations. It's yes. all about cooperation and crossover. So I highly recommend uh, local smaller retailers, no matter your retailers or operators, to cooperate with each other to do yes. more crossover, limited editions or also seasonal items so that, you know, people, they will come back, you know, to a shop and yeah. also your restaurant yeah mm -hmm. that you know uh, the main uh, strategy i think you know from my side yeah fair enough um good and uh moving on to the next question um what are your thoughts for the upcoming business stability for global travel retail so particularly the duty-free market due to the travel ban in view of the pandemic i mean the travel retail industry obviously has taken a big hit. So what, what are your thoughts? That's difficult, but I want to share actually, you know, um, yeah. notice, especially for travel retail, when we cannot travel, actually, how can we shop? So now yes. that, uh, I can see that a lot of, you know, duty free shops are doing a lot of online sales. Online mm -hmm. Second thing is, um, I noticed that um, one of the big travel retail uh, brand name, Heinemann, Heinemann, they also have their a pop-up store in central nowadays. So uh, travel retail, not necessarily in the airport anymore. They can right. you know, go out to the city. They can have a pop-up store. Of course, uh, to some extent is to uh, sell the inventories. So I think uh, have to be um, innovative and then, you know, think out of the box on how to sell a product, you know, for travel retail. Yeah, mm. understood. Um, any other insights from Sonia or Barry? Um, I think it it would be the same thing like um, what I've mentioned before is um, the stores, the duty free stores which are local, uh, which are uh, located downtown, mm -hmm. and uh, they also need to start um, thinking about um, how to cater better to the locals, yeah. um, because the in store traffic um, nowadays has become very, very quiet. And uh, even people who, who do walk in uh, would be locals. And, yeah. and the duty-free business has the advantage. They have some um, exclusive um, items, which you cannot buy outside, for instance. And right. uh, they have like um, uh, money for value uh, packages where you can buy more uh, for, for a better price. Uh, so there should be a little bit of a differentiation about, for instance, um, uh, uh, luxury cosmetics, um, what you can find in um, individual stores and what you can find in um, uh, 
uh, travel retail, there should be a distinct uh, differentiation. Yeah. In that way, it can also attract locals back in, I guess. Yeah. And uh, yeah. about the, the travel retail, which uh, those stores which are based um, inside the airport, I think uh, there we can only hope that someday we all can fly again. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Sonia. Uh, Barry, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I think the, um, for the local customers, um, when they travel, they, they do like the special uh, uh, items that um, are available in the airport and, yeah. and, uh, and um, uh, they only sell in that area. So I think for for, um, for the duty free use, I guess nowadays, they need to really um, let the locals know that they do have items that are really specialized, only can get it from them and set up a pop-up store like what, what Cindy just mentioned. Yeah. So just more exclusive items, um, pop-up stores as a strategy to tap into the market. I think even for our side in, in recruitment, we, we see, um, you know, increase in demand for, for, as you mentioned earlier, you know, part-timers, temp staff to work in these pop-up stores to help raise brand awareness for certain startup brands or even duty-free brands. So yeah, this sort of echoes what you guys said. Um, I don't see any more questions on the Q&A. Uh, just a final chance uh, and shout out to everyone. Does anyone have any more questions they want to ask? Nope. Okay. Well, I want to take the opportunity once again to thank Cindy, Sonia and, and Barry for participating in today's webinar. Um, you know, really appreciate your time. Really appreciate the, the sharing as well. Um, this more or less concludes our webinar for today. Uh, so I wish everyone, you know, a, a safe and uh, wonderful weekend. And uh, thank you again for participating. Thank you, guys. Thank you thank so much. You. Bye. 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 Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care. Bye.